Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is the third annual partnership between the European Parliament's Liaison Office in Washington, D.C. and the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Uh, we come together once a year to highlight one of the finalists of the European Parliament's Lux Audience Award. And specifically today, we're going to be joined by Jan Komasa, the director of Lux Audience Award finalist Corpus Christi, which I hope everyone had a chance to watch earlier this week. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce Joseph Dunn, the director of the European Parliament Office in Washington, D.C., and um, uh, I'll let Joe take it from here. Hey, Joe. Thank you, Jan. Uh, yes, I'm Hello, the everybody. director of the Parliament Office in Washington, D.C. Um, it's one of the best, best jobs in town, so thank you very much for introducing me, Alex. Our, our main function is to connect uh, the European Parliament and the uh, US Congress. Uh, that's why we were established 10 years ago. Uh, but well, of course, we also do other things. And I think outreach and cultural outreach especially is, is very important. And we have found this collaboration with the USC School of Cinematic Arts to be fantastic. Uh, as Alex just said, this is the third year. And each time we've been able to have the director of the film and a contribution from a member of the European Parliament. So in this case, we're very happy that we have a Polish member of the European Parliament, uh, Mr. Uh, Thomas uh, Frankowski. Uh, he's a member, a uh, leading member of our Committee on Culture, which is the parliamentary committee which had the idea of inventing the, uh, the prize. It used to be called the Lux Prize and it's now called the Lux audience award um, we try the parliament and the european union tries to support cinematic production in this way uh, I, they help with i think the distribution principally and add subtitling in different languages and i'd be interested in hearing from jan later uh, what he thinks or, or how he thinks the award might have helped him in this particular in making this uh, stunning film and you know what the European Parliament perhaps could think of or could what help further help we could give to uh, European cinema uh, going forward. So I don't I don't want to hold up the discussion, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, it's a very impressive film, and I'll hand over to um, our MEP, Mr. Frankowski, who is a friend of the United States, who played football here in Chicago, as you will hear, and um, I think has good words to say about the film. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure to be here with you all for this singular event with friends from both sides of the Atlantic spanning from Warsaw to Brussels to Washington DC and to Los Angeles. The European Union and the United States are four and foremost united by history, common democratic values and the protection of fundamental high rights. Today it is critical to support EOS EU ties and remind ourselves and the entire world the importance of supporting democracy, the rule of law and free societies where the arts can freely be expression of thoughts of their citizens. The European Parliament believes in the transatlantic partnerships. This is also manifested with our only liaison office outside the European continent. Our office in Washington DC focused since 2009 on building ties between us European Parliament members and our counterparts at the US Congress. My pleasure of being here with you today, it is also due to the fact that this feels like I'm reconnecting with my many friends all over the United States, especially those in Chicago, where I spent a fantastic year of my previous life as an international soccer player. So allow me to say, let's go Chicago Fire. Back to the business though. As you may know, I am a member of the Culture and Education Committee in the European Parliament here. One of our important annual moments here at the European Parliament 
is the European Lux Audience Award, our very own annual cinematographic prize highlighting, celebrating and supporting European films that speak about of our Europe and European soul. What an incredible platform cinema is for debate and reflection not just on Europe, but on values that transcend all boundaries and distances. Our European USA transatlantic partnership does not only come alive in matters of global trade and security, but also through the celebration of the universal language of the arts, including, of course, cinema. Please allow me to stress one incredibly important and unfortunately still topical point of in many places around the world, including here in Europe. It is our duty to support freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom in all its forms. Cinema remains one of our strongest tools in this important fight. My colleagues in Washington DC have told me what a great reception Corpus Christi has had in the United States. I warmly salute Jan Komasa, director of Corpus Christi and fellow Polish compatriot. It comes as no surprise as we here at the European Parliament have chosen this film among the Lux Audience Award 2021 finalists. Jan's film tells the struggle of a 20 years old young man who utilizes his out of the ordinary life experience to be actively involved in the community. This movie demonstrates how filmmaking can be such as consciousness raising force. I hope you enjoyed this film as much as I did and thanks to Jan's work also got a historical and cultural insight of my country Poland. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit the creative and cinema industry, but we are working hard to bring all people back to the theaters and enjoy cinema again as we know it. I wish you a good discussion and look forward to come and visit the United States soon. Thank you. So um, thank you so much, Jan, for joining us. Uh, Joe, thank you for, for all of uh, uh, your kind words. This is exciting. I, we were, um, we were going to have you on campus, uh, and it didn't work out last year. So I'm really glad that we can do something with you now. Um, as uh, everyone out there may know, Corpus Christi was nominated for Best Foreign Language Film at the Oscars last year. and. Um, it's, it's really a, a privilege to have been able to share it with everyone again. Um, so thank you, Jan. Thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. At last, at last, I have the privilege to finally through uh, via um, Zoom right now. But actually, yes, you're right. I was almost, I, I almost made it for the screening last year due to some crazy medical conditions uh, I couldn't, um, unfortunately. This year, again, pandemic, which we might call a medical condition as well as of some sort. Uh, but at the same time, combining it with Lux Price, it's a huge privilege because I think Lux, Lux Price, um, in a way, reflects what the European Union um, stands for and was founded for, uh, which is uh, which is, I think, belonging, and I the belonging, uh, being together, um, and Corpus since Corpus Christi is was meant to be a film about belonging. I think it's uh, it's um, it has twice as much of an impact. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that we meet and and thank you for it. I I take it as a great privilege. I just want to quickly mention to the people watching that if you wanna ask a question, just type it up in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, after we've been talking for a bit, we'll start to uh, welcome you into the conversation as well. So just use the Q&A box. And um, uh, I guess, yeah, well, let's start with really where this began because um, uh, people may or may not know that there is some like real history of, of, of someone impersonating a priest. It's not, this film isn't a direct adaptation of that, but I am curious to know um, the things that you were reading about that inspired this uh, this story. 
Yeah, well, um, yeah, it all started with the, with an article. Uh, it was, the article was written by back then a journalist, Mateusz Patsevich, who uh, researched um, cases of people impersonating priests in Poland, which funny enough, I learned is not a rare phenomenon. <laughs> Yes, it, it kind of, it, it calls for some kind of dissertation or I don't know, a thesis or, but um, in a way, you know, it struck me as symbolic, especially in Poland, since Poland is, has a, 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 a huge, um, a huge chunk of population is um, religious and, uh, and Roman Catholic um, way. So, um, Mateusz researched some of these cases and he um, combi compiled them into one storyline and then decided to make a film approached by another producer, a friend of mine. Once they got the first or one of the earliest drafts, they, they sent it to me and I read it. I, I really liked it. I really liked uh, what came like the, the Mm, anecdotal force behind the, the pretty well-known concept of somebody impersonating a priest or or a, or a person of faith, right? We we had um, sister act, let's say, <laughs> with Whoopi Goldberg. So, but it's and at the same time, you know, reading this, knowing it's not a comedy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it was kind of striking. Like you can have an anecdotal arc and. Um, a pretty uh, profound um, impact uh, stemming from the fact that this particular person really wants to be embedded in a, so, uh, in a community and lead it for a while, at least to feel that he, he thinks he, uh, he might contribute, but to, at the same time feel loved and mm -hmm. accepted. So, and we started to work on it and it went smoothly. Uh, I've never, I really, I, I usually I work um, extensively with, with research. This time I decided not to reach out to the, to all, so to some of the characters from the article, from the original article, you know, I felt it's all there, it's already, there in the script, I don't need to sort of, I was research, researching the, the church, re researching uh, more ceremonies, church, um, this particular community, we went to up, up um, to mountain region in Poland, um, also, you know, uh, correctional facilities somewhere to know how these boys react and what are the, the group dynamics um, within that, community so yeah so that's that was basically i was i was approached as a as a director and here with with a very solid script already and obviously i i came up with my input but it was done beautifully by the script writer and the producer you know, both i'm curious if you even though you, you didn't um you didn't want to overly research it if you did get a sense of what motivates the, the real people to impersonate priests. I mean, the, the Sister Act uh, 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 counter example in cinema is, is one where, you know, sort of like she needs to flee uh, for her life and finds, you know, that this is a safe haven. But um, you chose to have your protagonist actually want to be a priest and then yes. found himself in happenstance in the situation where uh, the lie sort of takes shape and he actually gets this opportunity. So. Um, I'm curious That's if you've got a sense of why people do it. Well, yeah, well, um, you know, the original case or cases had this sense of fleeing as well, but the, this uh, element of, of wanting to contribute spiritually to the community took over at some point. And, um, and in the film, I, I felt like, okay, you know, this is a guy who has to start from the scratch, uh, having like, he's 21, he just left um, the facility, uh, juvenile detention, 
so he has to face the reality which is harsh because people his age usually study already and you know the train left the station for him basically and so he is uh, if there is a social ladder and we all know there is one um he is scrambling he's at the bottom of it and he knows it he knows it um he sees his faith uh, watching other boys from the facility working at the sawmill um, and decides not to like decides well that's the funny thing because we were working on it you know until the very first day of shooting philosophically there is a moment in the film between that our character deciding not to take part in this re rehabilitation program at the soul mail and um lying mm -hmm. there's this like i would say six or seven minutes in which he doesn't really know what to do with himself so it's pretty tricky i don't i was i was pretty i uh i feel uncomfortable as director uh when i'm in the this area I, i'd rather better know what uh, my character wants to do but it was kind of tempting because you know we tried different options what if it was his plan to fake and from the get-go but then it was all too obvious what if it was a sheer coincidence like in real life so we we decided to go after the seren serendipity of this whole situation which is he yes he he wanted to do it but it wasn't his plan that was the, the difference between the desire and a plan and once uh we were able to differentiate it um the whole film made made sense and that's how we started to work on um st to structuring uh this particular first 30 minute sequence emotionally i ha i was struggling like once he's already the a priest it was it's so much easier because he has a goal but before it's you know i was i was looking for it really uh, until the first day of shooting uh, i re i remember the moment we when we finally got it and the, the and that was very revealing like from from me i had the goal um i, I... I find one of the really phenomenal um, screenwriting accomplishments here uh, is that you know the terror that you as the audience feel when he gets up to to deliver like of his first sermon, and you're like, what is he gonna? What's gonna come out of his mouth? I mean, you know, there's obviously the ritual side of it that you know you you can sort of assume he's sort of got the muscle memory of, you know, and he can look other stuff up but really having to come up with original thought that's going to um, sell this persona to, to, the, to the town um, really does leave you in suspense. And then you come up with um, some very moving, I think, um, discussions that he's making that obviously allow us to really understand psychologically where he's at and how that's translated to how he wants to help the people in the town. Um, that must have been incredibly difficult to come up with. I mean, the the things that would that would both read as a sort of novice sermon writer with someone who's got something to say, and that could be believed in this situation. So tell us a little bit. Yes, about that. totally. Well, it's one it was one of the hardest parts in the film because not only you have to um, have um, have you have to um, uh, uh, convince. Um, characters in the film that he can do it but also the viewer has to be convinced that they are convinced so the viewer has to believe it actually might have happened <laughs> so uh, so yes it was tough but um, I would say the antidote and the the only way we found was simplicity which is pretty re revealing once once you're there he basically he's using he's not a very like a super literate person he he's not a philosopher but he's down to earth he knows life he broke all the ten commandments um don't kill included 
so he he has been there and he knows life and he that's why it gives him so i i would say even superpower of uh, ultra knowledge um that's why probably when there's a scene of confession he knows what to say and he he he's okay like he is not surprised by anybody's sin um so you know in terms of sermons as well uh, this first sermon is basically staged uh, using pauses and silences and and a proper tempo i think that was what's um what was missing before in in this particular church um people was they, they weren't listening and he because he says so little he makes them listen to the, the silence and he says silence is important like it's good to to be silent for a while and that's okay and it's pretty revealing the simplicity of it the authenticity of, of, of our main character he is he's young he's a novice but at the same time it's his superpower and that's why he he is given credit for um, for whatever he's doing by people uh, in a village who are significantly or usually and in real life as well older mm -hmm. uh, so he comes out sort of not only they, they 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 rather treat him as a struggling young priest rather than somebody who doesn't know how to run sermons sure. and so um so yes so i think that works and once uh, Bartosz Bielenia, the main character, um, got on stage, it, it was, I decided to be as close as possible to his amazing guys. So we're dwelling a bit more on <laughs> in the moment, <laughs> watching his gaze and piercing, um, you know, his, his eyes and, and bluish, and he can easily switch from angel mode to the demon mode uh in the film so i felt this is the strength of this character and i don't have to move my camera too much i um i, I want to talk about his performance but before um we get to that i did want to explore this idea of um the ways in which the church are able to like interact with community these days uh you know i i, I grew up part of my life um, in Italy and there's a lot of obviously um, a sort of decline in the in the, the, the youth sector of, of going to mass and uh, and so when you see you know a priest come in and deliver a sermon like this you're like oh okay like I would go to that <laughs> you know there, yeah. there's a, yeah, totally. a, a renewed vigor in terms of the message that's being delivered and I'm curious if if um, you know how much of that was uh, a commentary on the church versus a, a, a commentary on the character for you. Yeah, well, it's a very interesting distinction you're making here. I think, you know, um, obviously the church is calling for some kind of, um, of um, rejuvenation, renewal, um, obviously. Um, it's, uh, there's a whole debate, just, you know, I, I, I can hear from from the press here in Poland, but there's a, a debate about Francis, Pope Francis, and what he's doing with the church and the believers and people who are discarding it because it's too edgy. Um, and there's a lot of like this, there's this schism uh, feeling, uh, especially in Poland among some circles, more are orthodox and more leaning towards John Paul II um and so i you know somebody told me after watching this uh, corpus christi that um main the main character daniel from our film is more like a revolutionary like somebody who who by like pulling the curtain down and making it more down to earth more humane more timid more normal he it's it's it is in and of itself revealing for many people it's new they 
it totally goes like people buy it um maybe they're not comfortable with it because it's unceremonial but at the same time it works and he is direct and directly tackles their problems uh, naming them um and saying it's okay like you know everybody is a sinner don't worry and it's you know it's um uh, he sort of destructuralizes the, the whole church so, somehow he makes it uh, benign and regular and for people in the village uh in our film it's like a revolution nobody talked to them um before like this and um that's why they they follow him um so yes in a way yes this is uh probably in line with the critique of this orthodox solid cemented way of uh of how the church is uh, being run by this very uh tough uh, structure that coalesced around vatican mm -hmm. and then it was so solid and rock is rock solid that it could it was almost impossible for for um people with i would say more visceral vision to come up with some something much more humane and lively and and maybe spiritually revealing and healing also uh helpful uh so yes i think you know there is a certain amount of take on uh the division in the overall um um church and how church is being uh, um perceived nowadays especially but there's also i think in terms of the character he finds his own way because the only thing he knows is how to sort how to sort of be an, a nobody within a group um if uh, there is this pre-assumption of him being um in, at the juvenile detention uh for six years prior to uh when the film film starts and um so the only thing he knows he grew into being a nobody like a, like a, we called it even in harsher uh terms we called it uh um um he he felt like a scoundrel and he sort of he felt almost comfortable being one like somebody with a broken spine bone and then somehow through fakery he is healing himself and becoming somebody at least even though it's a it's a fake identity but maybe it's a maybe it's some kind of a psychotherapy um ther ther uh, therapy um also it has this quality of um organically healing yourself and living a borrowed life for a few months uh, before you stand on your own feet firmly so yes it has both both angles like the church the bigger angle and the more subjective character angle what I, what the, another story point that i thought was incredibly uh nuanced and uh important i think um was when you when you actually reveal to us uh towards the end that the 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 widow feels that there may have been that you know we've we've been sort of on this journey thinking that this man was completely completely innocent of what happened in the accident that you know we're sort of led to think the student the students might have been drunk and you know partying and whatnot and there was this great injustice but that at, at the end there is a nuance there that she thinks that there was you know some 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 guilt on her part some rage that he left in anger and you know all of that and it's such a beautiful moment because you realize like you know we we saw this from one side we saw it from his side 
Now we're seeing it from her side. And really there's no like perfect, you know, uh, understanding of what really happened. Um, tell us about including that scene because it's, you know, it, it does come right at the end and it kind of puts everything we've learned about that accident into a different perspective. Totally. It, um, it's it's, it's far, funny that you bring it up because I kind of, it was one of my ideas to input it um, by the end of the film um, to plant a seed of doubt mm. whether it was all worth it or not. Uh, so, so yes, and we were actually uh, writing the scene. We, we were shooting it by the 20th day of shooting, no, 20th of 30, of, of 30 days. So it was closer to the end. And that's why during 20 days of shooting, I grew more and more anxious about the scene, knowing well, yes, watching how it goes as a director and, you know, putting up all the scenes together, suddenly I realized, yes, this scene is getting more, more and more important, even more than it was just in the script. In, like in the script, it was just another dialogue, long dialogue scene in which characters are confronted with some sort of a, an issue they're trying to address. And here, <clears throat> I realized it will be very powerful because it will, as you said, it will reverse everything we, we've learned and we build up to, the, to this particular moment. And by the very end, with, while rehearsing with actors, um, I was, by the way, uh, for, I'm, I'm sure you, you know this, but for, for those of you who know uh, the, the film, for those of you who don't, I highly recommend it, one, one, one of my favorite films. Uh, I love the film Separation by mm. Ashgar Faradi. And there is a, a, a pretty similar ending. Right, right. In which something like, like we're, uh, the whole film is based on a certain perception of the events that happened that led to um, miscarriage uh, of one of the characters. And by the end, there's a totally different explanation of what, what really happened. And here I decided to kind of, I, because I love this film so much and I felt, well, it's all about the same here. Like something happened in the past, people cling on to certain truth about it. Then by the end, maybe we can uh, play with it and tell like you, we, do, we don't necessarily know the truth. The truth is um, inconceivable. It's something that be, that's beyond our reach as people. And obviously community needs the truth. It doesn't matter if the truth is true, but it needs a certain truth for itself in order to be legitimized as a community, right? To, to have something to cling on to, to have a myth, right? Even if it's a fake myth. So in a way, the community does exactly the same thing as our main character who fakes something in order to feel stronger as a person. The community does the same thing with an accident. They um, construct a myth, a legend behind it. And suddenly by the end, we might learn that the, we would probably never hear uh, the real explanation of what really happened. And th that's what Daniel realizes by the end of the film. That's what sort of reveals him. Um, and he realizes there's no sinners. There's no, you know, uh, necessarily like bad people, good people. There are, you know, bad choices, emotions, etc., And, you know, the only thing he can do is to go by himself and, and listen to his heart and, and run this funeral by the, by the end of the film, regardless of, of the defiance. Your, um, your, your lead actor, Bartosz, is an incredible screen presence. I have to say, like, really just jumps off the screen and he accomplishes a lot physically, you know, um, at times seeming 
very frail, and then at other times seeing very strong, particularly in the in the fight scene at the end where I'm just sort of floored by his dominance of a much bigger man in that fight. And I'm just, I mean, I, I what a gift to find an actor who can do all of that and deliver, you know, obviously the performance that he gives. Can you talk about how you wrote that character, what you were looking for, and then how you found Bartosz to actually, you know, um, take on the role? Yeah, well, it was a hell of a journey, I must, I must say, because we were finding this character, like, at first, you know, to, to reveal a, a little bit of the, of the kitchen, director's kitchen, uh, in order to apply for, um, for the for Polish Institute to get the money, to get the funding, you have to disclose uh, um, a dream cast. And the, the, we, didn't, we didn't know who will be the main character. So we had to give uh, the commission the names. And the main, the, the main actor was Tomasz Jentek, who plays ultimately the uh, the other guy uh, pincher sure but at the beginning we we felt like okay this is tomasz he's a star in poland uh he's a great actor um so maybe like i asked him can we put your name on the list but once we get the funding you have to be aware i would love to run a regular casting and he said sure fine do it and yeah and for for many months we were kind of with Tomasz as the main character and then Bartosz came and he did something incredible uh, he, he, he did something incredible during the casting he I gave actors 300 selected young actors came uh for the edition and I gave them two scenes each. One scene was to run a sermon in their own words. So it was improv, um, an improv, um, run a sermon and sing something, a religious song um, and convince me to some sort of a value. Uh, I wanted to sort of see how they react with the material whether they are convincing whether they would find a way their own way into stuff um and then the second scene was totally different a streetwise character um expressing anger towards the camera as if the camera was their friend who turned who had turned them in at the police station so expressing anger sorrow uh the felt the feeling of betrayal and you know out of this 300 people that came it was sort of half and half uh, half of them was great at being criminals and half of them was great at, at bring, being priests and me myself obviously uh, the, the basic approach would be to find somebody who would embody both greatly and so that, that's something I was looking for. And suddenly Bartosz came, long hair, sweater, with a dog, you know, totally, I, I, he would kill me. I call, I call, you know, I, I call him like a 200% hipster look. <laughs> and, and he did two, these two scenes and he didn't succeed in any of them. Really? Totally you know in neither yeah it was amazing because he thanks to his interpretation i realized that this character is neither a criminal nor a priest and he wasn't even trying to convince. he didn't know the script but by his intuition and gut and even though he looked totally different from what we've expected well obviously uh, he was on my radar, radar because he's super talented and he has the stage pers uh, personality. He was um, frequently here in one of the best theaters in Poland uh, on stage and people talked about it, uh, his performances, etc. but not, he didn't have any uh, yet big role in, 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 in movies. And so my producers 
uh, Leszek, the producer, were, was pretty anxious when I told him, like, Bartosz, Bartosz is the best. And he said, like, this guy, he's thin, he's not a crook, he doesn't look like he's a hipster, man. Like, you, you, but, you know, we gave, you know, I, I was kind of, I felt something, then he came again and again, and I started to talk with him a, a lot, and he um, made me realize that this character is, this character is a, is a different somebody than I thought. It's, this character is a man in the making. He is not fully made by the end of the script, but at least he learns a thing about himself. So it's like a gray uh, material which is less gray by the end of the film, but we're all, all, all the time we're in a gray area of a person that, is, that has a broken identity because it was sort of frozen in time by the sentence he was serving and a, a thing he did that unfortunately in a society like ours, um happens to be part of the identity once you do a crime um uh, it becomes you right and the society even you can try no matter how how hard you can try uh uh the society will always help you <laughs> um uh, will, will always remind you who you are because you did something in the past so the past is always stuck like glued to whatever you're doing. So that discovery led to a series of other discoveries within the script and it uh, laid um, the foundation for Daniel, who is um, a person with a dream, a person with a calling. And, you know, and discovers for himself that yes, uh, you know, life is worthy of living maybe because there are people still wanting you to have you in their community, even if it's a fakery. So that was that was revealing, and um, and yeah, and we were working on uh, by the end of the when when I was designing it with my scriptwriter and Bartosz, by the end of the film, I remember um, we had this beautiful big cardboard and on it. I draw, uh, I drew like 27 different Daniels by the end of the film. Uh, because each of them sort of adds up to uh, another one and another one becoming a different version of uh, and of the initial Daniel we, we start the film with. It's really interesting you say that because there have, uh, we got a couple of questions that really do um, want to explore the ending of the film and where he winds up. Um, let, me, let me just read a couple. Oh, this one is, um, uh, this first one is, uh, okay. For me, I was struck with a moral dilemma posed by Daniel who while um, an imposter did good in the community, um, is simply when discovered by the priest thrown back in juvie. Uh, was that part of your goal to have us left with this dilemma? I love the film and haven't stopped thinking about it. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, obviously I, I didn't want uh, a comforting ending that would leave you too comfortable not to think about it. I'm, I'm pleased with people uh, asking questions. I, I'd rather make films that spur people into ask, ask questions rather than give answers. But yeah, um, with the arc of him coming back to the juvie, we, I wanted to sort of close the circle of his journey. And, and so it's much more made hopefully visible for the, for, 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 and tangible for the viewer to, to realize that he, um, he discovered something about himself. He's different in the same place by the end of the film and at the beginning of the film. 
Um, at the beginning of the film, he doesn't even have, um, I wouldn't say his, he is empty, but there's not much of a personality there. There's a calling, there's some, something really small and, and modest, but nothing in particular. By the end of the film, we have somebody with a certain type of, I don't know actually what exactly it is, but some sort of strength he was able, the spiritual strength. But at the same time, something depressing because he was trying something and you know the reality told him this is not the way so he's being rejected he feels rejected he doesn't know about the widow at the village who was actually eventually accepted by the community and ushered in during the mass right so he he hasn't witnessed it he doesn't know about it this little miracle uh, he was working on for the whole film yeah um, which is pretty heartbreaking, but yeah, that's how it is with reality, right? But what he's faced with is his past and the brother of the victim he killed um, by the end of the film, Bonus. So he fights Bonus, and by the end of the film, it's sort of like we we have a broken character. We have a we, we have a, I wouldn't say broken, maybe it's too strong, but a fallen angel of some sorts. <laughs> I would say um, a guy who decides to, yes, you wanted to me to be a, a murderer. Here I am. I'm going to kill this guy now. I, I will do it on purpose. Maybe I killed somebody in the past when I was 15 years old and I, I wasn't totally co conscious of whatever I'm doing. But now I'm going to do it because you want me to at least be labeled in this reality, in this society, right? And there's one person who prevents it from happening with Pincher, who saw him performing a mass and he was changed by him. So not directly, but indirectly, Daniel sees a, a, a plan of hope in somebody else. And this come back to him, comes back to him uh, by the end of the film as sort of in a karmic way. <laughs> And he's being reborn by the end of the film. This other question that came in also about the ending um, from Scott uh, reads, I found the ending very satisfying. I could see a parallel with Christ's crucifixion and the extrapolation of three days suffering and battling in hell before resurrection. So I felt that Daniel would come out of this okay. Was that ending always in the script? Was there a lot of trial and error to get to that ending? Can you share if there were other endings envisioned or shot. P.S. In English, um, there's a phrase, fake it till you make it, which seems to apply to your narrative how Daniel will be a better person having falsely posed as a community spiritual leader. Yes, that's the mo motto of Elizabeth Holmes. I, I saw the documentary lately and that, that was her motto. So she was the, the Corpus Christi character, but who didn't succeed as well. <laughs> so, but it, it's a different story, obviously. Um, yes, thank you, Scott, for this for this question. I um, yeah, well, there, there, I, you know, while making this film, you, you feel the temptation of uh, drawing compa comparisons and and sort of connecting the dots with the Bible and especially with the New Testament. Because obviously in New Testament, you have a person who comes into the community to change it and to, and to you know, spark uh, some kind of a revolutionary movement um, by becoming uh, down to earth, reaching out to those in help, reaching out to those rejected. So same things have like are being performed by Daniel in our script in 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 this film um he reaches out to the widow who was rejected by the community he's the, he's probably the first person to reach out to her since the accident so um yes there is a lot of traces there um that that might lead to uh Jesus Jesus uh, Christ figure um i knowing this i didn't want to overplay it so i I would rather keep it low as, as low as possible. 
but yes, by the, by the end, like someone told me, oh, you Poles, you have to have this bloody cathartic, very Catholic endings all the time. Like if if like the, the character has to go through a, a huge ordeal in order to to understand something, otherwise it's not New Testament ish. <laughs> and yeah, it there's a bit of you know there's something to it definitely. Um, I just felt it was also my input. We had different endings, especially the first draft of the script. I can now um, I, I can. Re reveal it to you. Um, the first draft of the script was totally uh, different when it finished. It finishes with Daniel leaving the juvenile detention center. There was no bonus character. There was no confrontation with the victim's brother. Nothing of that. There was no victim's brother by the end. By the end. That was also something I, I've added. Um, he was just leaving the juvenile detention center and there was Martha, the girl from the village, waiting for him in the car. So he jumped in. They drew off into the sunset. But then there's an epilogue scene by the end where when he asks her to um, uh, to pull over by the, 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 you know, there's this church and he asks her, like, stop the car here. And she stops the car. He takes out the collar again and he enters the church in which people are waiting for him so the story goes on mm -hmm. with him pretending in other areas of the country right so i felt it was yes i understood it but it was for me it was too sweet i maybe this bloody catholic uh dna in me called for some kind of a <laughs> uh resurrection of the main character or re the sense of being reborn again so that was the end the ending at the at the in the first draft I, i've gotten then we, we the, the flirted to different endings the movie, right where each week yes. he goes to a different town and solves their problems addressed as yeah. <laughs> yeah there's actually you know we, we obviously you know it's the reality right after the film uh was released in toronto at Toronto Film Festival, some of people came, approached uh, us and in order to acquire rights for the film. And they were actually eager to make, uh, the, you know, Corpus Christi the second and the third, because the story can go on and go on. And it can be in and of itself an anecdotal arc for the main character to becoming a bishop. There was even the story of somebody faking it until he be became a bishop in in Spain, I guess it was Spain. Sixteen years of 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 impersonating a priest led him to become a bishop, and nobody even checked his papers. So that was one of the sh shining examples. So you know, young Pope, why not? You know, this is like three seasons of young Pope to Jude Law. Maybe we can think of something here. There is actually a, 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 um, a script, um, uh, this TV series in uh, now, made now, um, based on Corpus Christi, the, the film. Wow. So made, I mean, made, it's too much. It's still in the, in the, this process of, yeah. of um, now finding the head, out, uh, head um, author somebody who oh, the like show. um who will showrunner who will yeah. format the whole show and give the taste of but with the same character uh, in usa i would say usa okay wow. um usa i would even say south of usa closer to the mexico border um i'm seeing a hand up from grant and uh so Grant, I'm gonna allow you to talk and if you've got a question, just feel free to use your mic. Unless of course you raised your hand by accident, which I'm sure happens. Maybe it's the cat. <laughs> um, let's see. I don't know if I'm also like stopping his mic from working. Um, Okay, well, Grant, you're welcome to jump in if, if you uh, 
if you want to turn on your mic at some point. Um, so I there was a, there was actually something that um, I wanted to ask if Joe wanted to to jump in at all with, about uh, to talk about the Lux Audience Award program in terms of you know um, how featuring a film like Corpus Christi really does help to expose um, audiences around the world to you know really th the best of European cinema um, and. Uh, maybe give us some thoughts on, on how Lux achieves that and, you know, what the, what the process is in terms of uh, getting to the, the, the three finalists that, that we have this year. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe, your, your, your mic is, uh, you're not muted, yeah. but we're not getting sound from you. Oh, yeah. There we go. Well, hold on a sec. Joe, would you mind just trying? Oh, that is weird. No, we, we lost your audio. Maybe the same thing happened with Grant. Let me see if, uh, if I mute and unmute you, that does anything. Okay. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I don't know, you might have to reconnect your audio. But I mean, let's, well then I, I'll, I'll kick that over to you, Jan, while, while, while Joseph is uh, um, checking his, his audio. Um, the film has obviously had a, an incredible run, including an Oscar nomination. Um, and so, you know, now you're, you, you know, the film has sort of like a second, a second round of, or a third round of um, achievements and accolades, you know, with the Lux Audience Award. Um, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are in terms of like a film like this, uh, getting seen around the world, you know, um, obviously uh, the, the film had proper theatrical distribution in the United States, which is always um, uh, critical and, and, and very hard to do for an international release. So, um, just tell us about your experience sharing this film. And I guess, you know, particularly in the past year uh, when it's been in such an unusual format. Well, thanks for, I, I, I think Joe's mic is on. Yes. Uh, is it? Can you hear me now? Oh yeah. Okay. Hi Joe. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, well, what I'm gonna say is, is gonna be very really disappointing because I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert really on the, on the Lux Prize. We, I've I've seen, I mean I I have a broad understanding of the process, uh, um, which is chosen. But I think our colleague Ryan Malak, who's on, who was on the line, is would be more informed than me. But if I may, um, I mean I, I I think that well, obviously the prize is is going for the best kind of uh, most meaningful art film in a sense or a professional film, a provocative film, and I don't know, whatever the precise criteria are, I'm sure the Corpus Christi fulfills them because it's so such a, a thought-provoking film. And I, I think because it's a, a European Union prize, it, it um, tries, I think it looks for subjects that uh, appeal, that describe on one level a situation in one member state and this case it's it's Poland and um, I wasn't able to follow all of the conversation but I I believe from what I read that uh, part of the uh, motivation behind the film is this symbolism around the Smolensk um, accident and the, the national trauma I think that that caused for for Poland which is somehow uh, underlying it's kind of undercurrent in the film and last year we showed a, a, Span a Spanish a political film uh, or, uh, sorry, last year it was a Danish uh, film about the events in Congo, the uh, cold, the, the case of um, Hammerschild when, and his plane being shot down and the uh, very interesting suggestion that other forces might have been at play or, but it, it um, and before that we had the Spanish film about this uh, political situation in Andalusia and, you know, how, how you deal with corruption when you get caught up in in the web of corruption and it's a, it's a theme that uh, was very specifically spanish but at the same time uh, was eloquent 
and could easily be, be related to by, by any audience in Europe. So if I look at Corpus Christi, I'm, in, I'm from Ireland. Uh, I was brought up, I'm no longer a, a Catholic, but I was totally, uh, my education was totally Catholic and I, I can relate to everything in her film. I can relate also to the poverty in the film. I can relate to the, because uh, I come from sort of a fairly modest background, so I can also relate to the, the, the hardships that the people are suffering and you know the bravery of the people, the country people, everything, and even the fantastic photography. I'm sorry if I'm rambling on a little bit, but I, one thing that I personally thought wonderful were, were the, I thought they were Fellini-esque uh, landscapes where the, you know, the shot of the, of the, the quiet village and you know from what you've seen before the shot that so much is going on. So the landscape is almost talking to you. So it, it reminded me of, of some of Fellini's stuff, you know, that um, um, anyway, uh, I'm sorry for giving such an incoherent answer to Alex. I think I've broken all my own, own records so talking in the circle way. But I think the, it's a long answer to say that um, I think it's the universality sort of anchored in a very specific place and a very specific identity, a very specific aspect of Europe, which somehow is just it's one, one side of the diamond. You know, so just as um, uh, the United States is a very multifaceted place, um, perhaps Europe is even more multifaceted, but somehow there's an underlying, underlying unity in all of this and something, and it's more than just the basic humanity, it's also the the, maybe the shared experience so that you know Catholicism in Ireland and and Catholicism in Poland they became so intertwined in in the society for also for political reasons in Ireland it was it was um, had to do it was an, it was almost an expression of national identity so as we lost our language uh, the Catholicism became the sort of the label or the way of expressing your individuality and I think that's also part of the dynamic in Poland, you know, which is also linked to, to identity. So the, the whole, everything about your film is a, is a kind of in, interlocking wires that uh, I could really uh, plug in, I could plug in to any of them. So I'm really apologizing, Alex, for and Jan, for, you bring for this it. kind of long-winded answer. But I thought it was wonderfully thought-provoking for me as an Irish person and as a European. And you, you bring up a good point, which maybe uh, could could be a way to um, to sort of end the conversation here is, um, you know, a lot of here in film school, you know, there's a lot of analysis of film, um, particularly as being a product of a particular society at a particular time, sort of representing um, ident the identity of where it's from. And I, I'm curious because that is such an academic thing, but sometimes it is very much the case where you can very much read um, a, a film narrative as an allegory for larger issues in the country. And so I am curious, Jan, when, when you were making this film, how much you would say this, this feels like um, specifically a story that, that comes out of Poland as opposed to something that could be set in the United States like the adaptation would, would be, you know, what, what, what do you feel is its sort of identity in that sense. Well, I think, and thank you, Joseph, for, for your, uh, for your words. It's, um, it's really, you know, it's, it strikes, strikes the, 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 actually the core of what, what, whatever I'm thinking about, and not only, um, the struggle, um, of, you know, European nations to become, to, to sort of put us in context of becoming one, or you know, preserving the identities of each. You know, this it, it's gonna last forever. But it's great that we're talking and we're on the same sort of in the same realm, um, especially today when when the, the new power dynamic in the world is sort of I think exercised. But lately, we had G seven talking about it extensively. So, but. <clears throat> Especially now, I think European Union with its, um, unfortunately Brexit happened for many reasons, but you know, we're still one. And um, I, I feel proud that within, like, during my lifetime, I, I witnessed the collapse of, it was my early 
childhood, right? The collapse of one union and be like being sort of uh, becoming part one with another union, right? So it's like going from one to another. Um, it was a journey without basically moving. <laughs> so, but uh, yes, I think maybe that gives me the sense of flexibility and the changing of identity and how it's how important it is to recontextualize yourself um, every, uh, like uh, from time to time with the changing identity and the, the beautiful the beautiful thing, uh, full, uh, thing with European Union I think and looks price as a reflection of it is this that we somehow we um we have to uh pay respect and 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 to art and nurturing author cinema because that's what what for us 26 now different nations but at basically talking about europe much more you know this is the the this is basically our reality like we like we you make 100 or 200 30, 300 kilometers and you trespass another boundary of another country suddenly you're in a different reality and it's so easy to change realities in europe i know you in the united states obviously it's sort of the same coming from state to state but we have this daily it's for us it's the it's how we live it's totally jumping from one bucket to another um, and that's why probably people feel more and more disgruntled and insecure and these small communities you can find them in spain uh, in andalusia or in iron ireland or like maybe lars von trier showed this community in breaking the waves as well very orthodox and you know, you have these communities in Scandinavia, up north, you have these communities in the, the center of Europe, in Poland, small feeling rejected by overall big urbane, um, you know, uh, you know, power oriented, um, very with strong media presence, um, cultures and communities as well. So that's why I, I felt the urge, and obviously in the United States, which um, which, which is it, which comprises different small communities, right? That were pioneering two hundred years ago, and then small towns aroused, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, at, with certain values and certain codes at the core of them, right? So I was pretty much inspired by the this overall movement of yes we're together we're small we're together and we don't let anybody in but yes there is a stranger he might heal us do we want this do we want the treatment well, then we would have to destroy our myth as a communal um experience so so in a way also I'm rambling a little bit but in a way, I wanted to, to, to tell uh, that within this small, um, small microcosm of Corpus Christi, I wanted to convey something bigger, something that's more relevant probably to any community in the world, um, United States included, and definitely in Europe. You you'll find people we 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 see uh, political movements arising from this certain feeling of rejection. Uh, let's take yellow vests in France, small rural communities also disgruntled. Uh, same thing happens in Poland, obviously. So I wanted to give a reflection of it in my film. Well, thank you so much for sharing it with us and for really taking the time to um, elaborate on a lot of the really interesting nuance and creative decisions that you made. Um, I think the film is exceptional. I'm so glad that we actually showed it on the big screen here last year. 
<laughs> sorry that we couldn't do that this time around, but it was a real pleasure. And I, I really hope that you'll come back and join us, um, you know, with your next film or whenever you happen to be in LA. Yes, hopefully that happens soon. Uh, I was actually planning, I was hoping G7 Summit to give us a bit of, you know, <laughs> lifting of the restrictions but it didn't happen hopefully it will happen in a month or so so i can fly over the atlantic um but we will see hopefully you know we have now the the europe is europe is reopening so um i can connect with my friends from all around the place Thank you again, Jan. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, and thank you to the European Parliament um, for sponsoring the, the Lux Audience Award and for sponsoring this series that we've been doing now for three years. And uh, I look forward to doing this back in a the theater uh, in uh, 2022. And I hope, uh, yeah, I hope that everyone stays safe and, uh, and gets to go back out and explore the world as soon as, uh, as soon as the as soon as the world allows us to, um, yes. But, um, and and I, I just wanted to pinpoint that Grant still wants to say something. Oh, <laughs> Grant, this is your last chance. <laughs> no, all right, you can email me. Um, thank you both again so much, and uh, have a, have a wonderful summer. Thank you. Thank you. you too. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks very Alex. much. Thank you, Joseph. Thank, Thank you, you, Alex. Thanks, Thank Ryan. You. Thanks, Rand. Bye. Bye.